Hey guys, you're watching the Bade Zone with your host Baden Redshaw. I'm here with none other than our guest, John Morrison, aka Johnny Mundo from Lucha Underground. Now, to start off this interview, yeah, nice posing there. Um, when did you realise you wanted to become a professional wrestler, John? Let's see. That's a, that's a good question. Um, when I grew up and I was watching WWF as a kid, there was a couple things that I think you dream of when you're a kid, like becoming a pro wrestler, or becoming Superman, or becoming Batman. Oh, and uh, that's one of the first things I wanted to do was become a pro wrestler. I had no idea how, because back when you're a kid, you're a kid. <clears throat> yeah. And stuff doesn't really have to make sense. Yeah. Um, the first time I seriously considered it was when I saw Tough Enough in 2001, the first season. Mm. I was at UC Davis. I was uh, training every day, doing martial arts. I was a film major back then, making short action movies, um, <clears throat> working out, doing gymnastics, training myself to be an action film guy. Yeah. And when I saw Tough Enough, I was like, boom, that's it. That's what I wanted to do when I was a kid. It's like action design filmmaking, theater, everything that I think is cool all wrapped in one. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, what did you, what process did you have to go through to become a professional wrestler? I think the process that I took was luckily everything that I was passionate about I pursued and it ended up preparing me to be a pro wrestler. I liked wrestling in high school and college. You have to train really hard to do that. I liked martial arts. You have to train hard to do that. Um, I was prepping myself for for action filmmaking, which yeah. is uh, both the mental part of storytelling with visuals and the physical part of uh, gymnastics and training and flipping and kicking and yeah. delivering lines. Um, so, so luckily, following my passions led me to becoming a pro wrestler. Really, yeah. I feel like that's how most people that are successful in this industry end up becoming a part of it. It's yeah. it's what I grew up watching when I was a kid, and the guys mm. that uh, that have done the best grew up as fans and loving the business of pro wrestling so yeah. much so that it's just kind of integrated into our subconscious. Yeah, definitely. I, I a lot of times even now, like on film sets, I'll I'll describe. Um, screenplays that I'm writing in terms of a wrestling match um, you know heat spot a comeback a couple false finishes then a big finish to take it home leave yeah. people happy um, stuff that I when I talk about it like that uh, other wrestlers and wrestling fans completely get it immediately and um, yeah. sometimes people outside the, the industry have no idea what I'm talking about but yeah. um, I think when I'm talking about wrestling being ingrained into to my subconscious hmm. that's an example of it all right. Yeah, it definitely has to be something that you're passionate about. Um, all right. Well, how did WWE discover you when you first started off? How how did you how did they pick you up? Well, do you remember the show Tough Enough, right? Yeah. Was what was that? Oh, I was just saying. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just echoing hearing my own voice. Are you hearing your own voice? Sometimes. It's all right. All I'll, right. Just, I'll just myself. I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a show called Tough Enough that I mentioned just now. Yeah. I, I ended up becoming part of Tough Enough Season 3 yeah. and ultimately winning Tough Enough Season 3 and the prize mm. of which the contract with World Wrestling Entertainment. Were you in the same season that The Miz was in? Or did you go um, after The Miz or before... I was way before The Miz. So oh, you were before The Miz? So there was three original seasons, one, two, and three on MTV. And then The Miz was on season four. And yeah. there was a f several years in between season three and four. And mm. season four had a different format. All right. Speaking of The Miz, um, I want to talk to you about your, um, a bit about your tag team run. Because you teamed up with Joey Mercury and with The Miz in a few years after Mercury. Who, to you, was more of a... Um, how do I put it? Uh, who was more... Let's, say, let's just say fun to work with. Who was more 
Who did you find more better to work? Politically with? correct about this. Um, I when I when I was teaming with Joey Mercury, I feel like uh, he was the the leader of the team, the ring general. Yeah. And uh, he was he was a mentor to me in, in that tag team. I learned so much about the business from that guy and from that opportunity. The, yeah. the people that we got to wrestle as M and M was uh, me, me, Joey, and Melina got to wrestle. Eddie Guerrero, and Ray Mysterio, Bob Holly, Charlie Haas, um, Chavo, and Eddie Batista, and, uh, Edge. So many, so many experienced wrestlers and tag teams. Yeah. And um, I felt like we had a, a specific type of chemistry. We we ran like a really tight uh, offense, like a really fast-paced, hard-hitting style. And when I tagged with the Miz. A lot of the stuff that I had learned from taking with Joey and my other experience as a singles competitor, I, I brought to Ms. Morris in our tag team. And I feel like um, I was more of the team leader as far as the, having more experience than the Miz at the time in the tag team. And um, Miz and I had a completely different sort of chemistry where, I feel like, the Morrison character at that point was, at that point was a grounded. Mm. A grounded, focused, narcissistic warrior poet, and yeah, the Miz more, is uh, on kind point. of like this now, but a loud, abrasive, um, narcissistic uh, wrestler. And because yeah. of that, it created this this strange uh, relationship where we would constantly bicker and argue and try to prove between the two of us who was better, while at the same yeah. time working as a team. And um, that team was was interesting in that respect. And different from Eminem in that respect, but oh, okay. both teams were uh, some of my favorite members in the business. Both Joey and the Miz, um, amazing tag partners. Yeah. All right. Well, what has your favorite moment been in all of your wrestling career? Man, my favorite moment hasn't happened yet. Hasn't happened yet. Yeah, and, and you're uh, eyeing off that WWE title, aren't you? What's that? You're eyeing off that WWE championship, aren't you? Uh, you know um, that WrestleMania moment, something like that, it isn't means, it? It means uh, the title means less to me than the main event of WrestleMania. That's always mm. the one that I dreamed of when I was a kid. And oh, um, man, anybody that says they they wouldn't want a main event WrestleMania if they're a pro wrestler is nuts. Um, yeah, that would be that would be amazing. One of my dreams too. Um, are you a wrestler also? Um, no, but I've I've dabbled in backyard uh, wrestling. You know, just silly backyard stuff but um what's, I'm not uh, doing it anymore uh what was my finish I did um I did a move right it was uh it was like the twist of fate but before I did it I'd do the whole raise of the hand and the slit of the throat I'd call it the death drop and then you know right. commence the move but um yeah did these uh weird little nice. promos with um a video camera and black and white grainy video and I'd kind of talk into the camera talking about how I'm going to cleanse the world of their sins and all that and yeah alright yeah. I like that sort of like almost like a biblical prophetic type guy and you're, you're with from a great Australia, white edge obviously. you know a biblical a, biblical end times kind of thing but with a great white edge to it gotcha yeah in, a, in the same shape as Bray Wyatt or better shape <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I'm a lot more thin um, than him. Um, so you're a, you're you're in Australia. Yeah, Australian. Right on. Yeah. Um, where where from in Australia? Uh, Western Australia, Albany. That nearby Perth? Uh, yeah, just about five hours away from it. <laughs> That's not nearby. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I've done well, so many trips, right? From do you, do you Perth to Albany. Perth to Albany because I've had you know health issues and whatnot that um, that have been you know plaguing me a bit for the last probably seven maybe nine years. But um, coming from back at this time? Uh, no, uh, it's an illness that um, struck me a few years ago, which is um, yeah pretty unfortunate. But um, yeah, I, I try. I, I did most the podcast, bro. Uh, uh, talking about this illness and stuff. Yeah, just did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I've talked about is it, it still, a ton on my channel. Is it before. still a thing? Are you getting better, or is it uh, something that you're dealing with every day? Uh, it's a battle, you know, every day. Um, 
yeah, it's it's pretty tough. But you know, I, I get I get by. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, much respect. Good luck um, kicking oh, that in space. Yeah. No, it's it's been a tough battle, but you know, you've got to do what you can and got to keep fighting and push through, even when the doctors can't do much. You know, you just got to stay positive and you know push on through. <laughs> Yeah. But anyway, uh, what is um, if you could have any match, right, at WrestleMania or SummerSlam, what match type would it be, and who would it be against? Any match at WrestleMania or at SummerSlam. Mm. First of all, it would probably be at WrestleMania. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, or now, actually, like, have you? I mean, oh, I love SummerSlam. I'm just gonna say that right now. I love SummerSlam. Have you seen the Lucha Underground products, the, the show that I'm on now with Rey Mysterio? I've seen, I've seen a few, but it's very limited here in Australia because I've been looking online because you know how you've got the El Rey network that you guys, um, you know, play your show on? We don't have that okay. here, so I've had to, you know, go online and just, you know, look on YouTube and try and, you know, see bits and pieces. How about, uh, how about iTunes? Is it available on iTunes over there? I'm not sure. I might have to have a look. Um, Some sometimes I haven't looked into that. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes they block it in markets that it hasn't been sold to yet. Yeah, oh, that sucks. I didn't know it was completely unavailable in Australia. That's a bummer. Yeah. Oh well, it's. I've seen bits and pieces on the internet. It looks good. It looks like it's got a very different style. With the you know the cinematics of it all and um, yeah, just the way it's shot. Um, yeah. It's it's a hybrid of a, of a TV show and a wrestling show. Yeah. For sure. Um, and I was bringing it up because uh, the dream match that we're talking about now is WrestleMania or SummerSlam, which you mentioned you like. Mm. And um, the the uh, the greatest show of uh, Lucha Underground is called Ultima Lucha. Yeah. And um, so we could say if me, John Morrison, or now today, Johnny Mundo, yeah. could have a dream match at either Ultima Lucha or WrestleMania. Hmm. What kind of match would it be, and who would I wrestle? Um, this is a question that I get asked a lot, and the answer for me it changes uh, based on how I'm feeling, the hmm. mood of the day. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I I feel like I would like to have a pure singles match. Yeah. At uh, at either Ultima Lucha or WrestleMania as the dream match. Hmm. Um. Not necessarily a ton of gimmicks. I, I feel like right now I'm on my athletic peak and I couldn't perform and uh, command the attention of, of uh, without ladders and chairs and chainsaws. Yeah. So a singles match, a one-on-one -on -one match, and then the next question is against who? Man, um, I've had the opportunity to wrestle Rey Mysterio one-on-one. -on -one, um, Prince Puma, they're also known as Ricochet. Um, both of them have had the opportunity to do. You know, if, if I could have any match, um, I've, I've been in the ring with Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Cena, with, with Undertaker. Yeah. Um, the one guy that I really idolized as a kid that I think would have been amazing to be in the ring with was Macho Man. Yeah. So um, I would say uh, it would be me versus Macho Man one on one. Uh, no. Uh, no flamethrowers, yeah. or chainsaws, or bone saws, for that matter. <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be it. Yeah. Maybe a run by Johnny Nitro. All right. But in in a reality sense, because sadly, Marcher Man has passed on, who would be someone that's so, alive that you would so want to face? A more, a more realistic dream match. Not, yeah. a, not a dream dream match, just like that... Well, yeah, that, there you go. There's your dream match. But now let's get into the the reality side of life. Oof. Um. Man. Um. I would say possibly Prince Puma, Phoenix, Pentagon Junior. Um. All right. Son of Havoc. Tahano. There's a lot of there's a lot of talent that I have. For, been in the ring with hmm. and had matches with in the gender ground, but that I haven't had the opportunity to have like the 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 half hour 
Ultima Lucha WrestleMania match. Um, yeah. So one of one of those would probably be the the realistic dream match. Aside from that, there's a lot of talent yeah. at uh, in WWE right now mm. that uh, that's Seth have, Rollins. Have, have, have to take a shot at. What'd you say? That's Seth freaking Rollins. Seth AJ Rollins Styles as well. He, um, uh, them two are really talented. AJ, I've had a chance to wrestle a couple times, hmm. and man, I can't, I can't talk enough about how talented that guy is. Oh, Rollins, Rollins I've never had the chance to wrestle one on one. Kevin Steen, Kevin Owens, um, I had the chance to wrestle him once. Also, extremely talented. Hmm. I think there's anyone else on the roster. Um, Pot or, or Neville. Yeah. Maybe, I would love to wrestle him one on one. I've never had the chance to wrestle him. Uh, Prince Devitt, never had the chance to wrestle him either. Yeah. Or um, or Rollins. If, I was, if you were look, looking for me to pick somebody on the WWE roster right now, but I haven't wrestled because there's a lot of guys in the roster that I have wrestled that I know I'd it up with that I would love to wrestle again. Yeah. All right. Um, with the brand split making its way to television real soon, has WWE contacted you at all in regards to making a possible return for that? No. So we've talked about... Uh, I talked about making a return often. Yeah. Um, prior to the beginning of Lucha Underground, but since then... Um, no, I've heard rumors. I've heard all kinds of rumors. I've heard that mm, I'm, I'm coming back same. to Raw. All kinds of stuff. I'm reading it on Twitter. Um, yeah. What or not, it's true. I'm not at liberty to say right now. Yeah, you got to um, keep it disguised, though. I'm a. Uh, I'm planning on staying at Lucha Underground. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, with the, as far as the brand split goes, I mean, I, I haven't followed the product as closely as I usually do. I've been um, busy finishing up the season of mm -hmm. Lucha Underground. But, I mean, the, there's been brand, brand splits and brand recombinations and splits and recombined again. It doesn't seem yeah. uh, like that big of a deal. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are making a big deal about it, though. They, they try to advertise this uh, this new era, they, they say. Um, and, you know, they... They've done so many different things over the years, and yeah. Well, all right. Can you tell me the reason why you left the WWE? Um, really, it came down to just seeing things differently. In 2011, I had my first major injury, um, mm. and prior to that, I'd had a couple of knee surgeries. But in 2011, I had a I had like a, a major neck surgery, not as bad as a fusion, yeah. and um, yeah. some nerve damage that was, uh, doesn't bother me daily, mm. but it took, took a long time for me to recover from, and when I got back, I felt like I wanted to have the opportunity to have a little bit more of a life, have yeah. a little more time to myself to pursue filmmaking, writing, acting, action design, the stuff that I fell in love with when I was a kid, but I didn't feel like I was getting the opportunity to do in WWE. Um, and really it came down to that plus creative autonomy. I, I felt like I was pouring my heart and soul into this uh, company mm. that wasn't necessarily following through on the John Morrison storylines. Yeah. It wasn't using me the way that I saw myself being used. And mm. That can be a real pain, can't it? Well, in the defense of WWE, it's a, it's a billion dollar company. Yeah. And they they don't have the resources to do that for every one of their employees. Yeah, that's, they can only right. do that for the people that they see as their top guys. Yeah. But that was the difference. Yeah. I'm a top guy and I've always seen myself that way. Mm. And I, I know that they kept saying they had plans for me and all this all these different things and I got tired of waiting for it, so I left. Yeah. Uh, me personally, when I was watching this rivalry play out with you, Miz, and Cena in the mix, and the going into the Extreme Rules match. I was watching this. I was probably about at the time. It was at 2011, right? So I was probably oh, yeah. off the top of my head because I'm not really thinking right now. Uh, 16, 15. I was, you know, I was a bit young, younger, and I'm watching it on TV, and I'm thinking, 
oh, you know, this would be great for Morrison to finally get the title because at the time I just thought, you know, you'd really started to rise up with your character. And I thought, it yeah, this would be the moment to give Morrison the it title. It was a perfect time, but I probably didn't know is that that Extreme Rules pay-per-view, I, I was working that whole time with, like, the herniated disc on one side and, like, yeah. the broken vertebra on the other side, and I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't use my right arm very well. And yeah. as soon as that pay-per-view was over, I went to the hospital and got my operation. Yeah. Um, so they, and they, we knew that all ahead of time. Like, they, they said that'll be your last, mm. um, the last kind of thing you do, maybe the raw or something after it, and then you, mm. you'll go get that operation, get the pieces of your vertebrae taken out, and uh, so that your, your nerves aren't impinged anymore. Mm. But um, it would have been a good time. Yeah. With Lucha Underground, I want to ask you a bit about that, because I've been asking you a ton of WWE questions, and I think I'd better turn it over to where you're at right now. Can you tell us a bit about Lucha Underground? What is uh, the next upcoming... Do you guys do pay-per-views there? Because I know you guys do, um, you know, like the, the season and the episodes kind of thing. I, I don't know if you guys do pay-per-views or not. Do you do that, or are you different? Um, that? no. So... So right now, uh, Lucha Underground, I'd say, is, is a hybrid of a TV show and a wrestling show. Like, mm. your, your typical like wrestling promotion, like your uh, Smoky Mountain, your WWE, your TNA, your Ring of Honor. But, plus, an episodic TV show with a gritty action film vibe, a la Robert Rodriguez. Some, a really yeah. grindhouse, like, dirty vibe. So... Mm. As far as uh, pay-per-views, no, we haven't done any any shows that have streamed live yet. Everything is taped and has mm. post-production. Yeah. With your uh, filmmaking career, because you've been in a few indie films, I think, and um, and uh, you, I've heard a lot that you've mentioned about a film in a few in interviews. Uh, Boone the Bounty Hunter. Can you tell us a bit about that and what's going on there? Absolutely. Um, when we finish this interview, I'm going to the sound studio to supervise the, the final sound mix of Boone, as a matter oh, of really? fact. So, uh, Boone the Bounty Hunter is the, is the first film that I wrote, produced, and starred in. It's yeah. an action comedy centering around a bounty hunter named Boone. Yes. Um, Boone uses his name as a verb. Boone's celebrities, mm. a.k.a. Yeah. arrests them. So yeah. the show starts with Boone booning Kevin Sorbo or other celebrities. Then he finds out that his show is canceled. So he decides mm. in order to save his show, he's going to take his crew and go to Mexico to boon a real criminal yeah. in an attempt to grab some ratings and save his show. Then mm -hmm. he hits the fan, Boone and his crew get in trouble, and he has to fight, kick, and parkour his way out of trouble and save his friends. Wow. Yeah. Would um, the parkour... Um, thing. When did you start to uh, learn parkour? Like, when did you start to explore that sort of thing? For me, it was when I was in college. I mean, Jack Chan, I believe, was doing parkour before the term parkour was even coined. Mm. And when I was in college, I was doing the same type of stuff, flipping, kicking, and tricking, and trying to teach myself aerial awareness. Yeah. Then, in 2000... No, in 2007... That District uh, 13 movie came out with uh, with David Bell and Cyril Raffaetti, and they really that plus just the emergence of parkour in pop culture started to create this online encyclopedia of movements and tutorials, and um, I started realizing, hey, like this is exactly the kind of stuff I've been interested in, and here now there's this knowledge base of ways to train yourself to do all the different vaults, to calm your dash, to cash and then integrate your martial arts tricking with your column 360s and your dash bombs. And um, I started looking at it like like anything. Like it was a, mm. a skill, and the more you put into the skill, the more you get out of it, the better you become. So um, starting around 2007, 2008, I started in my free time, which is not a lot in WWE, training parkour. Mm. Then you saw in 2010, it really started becoming a part of my arsenal as a performer in the ring. Yeah. Um, I started busting out a lot more columns, column 360s, corner-to-corner -corner dives, 
yeah. um, side balls, speed balls, backstage parkour. Mm. And that was when I would start doing parkour at the building before TV tapings as a workout. And then using those plus like my day or two off, <laughs> you only get one or two when you're on the road full time a week. Yeah. Um, go to a gym and kind of up the ante a little bit skill wise. So yeah. that uh, that's kind of all the parkour happened to me and became a part of my arsenal and since then it, it's crazy because I'm uh, I'm getting older now mm. but I still feel like my physical skill especially pertaining to parkour and martial arts tricking has consistently increased yeah. which uh, I, I really think is just it's it's there's I believe there's such a thing as a physical intelligence yeah. and uh, that's really just the ability to navigate your body through three-dimensional space and it's like any kind of skill the more you train it the better you get at it like the muscle a muscle where it gets stronger the more you use it so mm. wrapping my head around 3d space how my body is muscle coordination balance stability neuromuscular connection all those elements mm. and training myself intelligently I think has allowed me to do things as far as martial arts tricking and parkour that I didn't think were possible when I was in my twenties. All right. Well, with um, companies like the WWE, and I don't know if this is the same with Lucha Underground. Actually, you can tell me if they're a bit different in in this area. Uh, creatively, are you a bit limited? Like, do you get to have the freedom to choose your own gimmick, your own name, or do you get that chosen for you? And, and that goes for the same with entrance music, etc. You know? I would say most wrestling companies are similar in that it's usually a collaboration. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you can't have a roster full of talent where everyone gets full creative autonomy. Yeah. Uh, the wrestling company can't function like that. Mm. So um, Lucha Underground, in my opinion, has gone out of its way to reach out to talents and involve them in the creative, the storylines, the entrance music, their ideas, their characters. Um, and WWE is also a collaboration, but they're such a big company that it's it's more difficult for them because they have less resources per wrestler percentage wise. If you if you understand what I mean. Yeah. Um, so and also, if you look at the most successful wrestlers, The Rock. Stone Cold Steve Austin, CM Punk, John Cena, the the things that usually helps them break through that glass ceiling, mm. and grab the brass ring, so to speak, yeah. was a combination of them being themselves, being somebody that people could identify with and relate to, and being provided with a platform or a stage so that millions of people around the world could see them do their thing. That, yeah. that is, what I think, the key to a good promotion is provide the platform and the stage and then get out of the performer's way and let them do his thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I'm just going to see what else I've got here. Let's do, uh, let's do one more question. All right, we'll go for one more. Yeah, I'll have a look what I've got here. Oh. So I want to uh, see... Right... Yeah. Um, all right. What? Who has been the hardest boss for you to work for? Oof. Um. Probably a no-brainer. Yeah. Vince, wouldn't it? No, I like. Oh, I like really? Vince. Um, I. A lot of people build this uh, image of him that he's so hard to work for, and he's so. I think that, that kind of ties in with his character on TV as well, wouldn't it? The whole yeah, but I mean, you got to keep in mind too that like a the the word boss means you're the boss, and you have mm. to be, tell people what to do, and you have to command respect, and that means that you can't just let everyone do what they want. Yeah. Um, if you're dealing with pro wrestling, for example, and a roster of of big old meatheads with egos, which is a lot of times what wrestlers are. Yeah. I imagine from the boss's perspective or a talent relations perspective, we might not be the easiest people to deal with. Mm. Maybe, maybe not. Um, Vince, I found, was 
a strange combination of completely out of touch <laughs> with current pop culture yeah. and an amazingly in touch with what works in the wrestling business and mm -hmm. what he likes to see. And sometimes there's a conflict with something that I thought and the way that he saw it and I feel like my idea to this day. I I always feel like my ideas are better. It's the it's why they're my ideas. <laughs> I think that's the thing that everyone thinks. Mm. Um, to this day, there's there were times where he rewrote a promo or had me do something a specific way that I completely disagreed with, mm. and there were other times where he had me do something like that and I completely disagreed with it. And then in retrospect, looked back and thought um, and thought to myself, yeah, you know, <laughs> he was right. He's yeah. uh, he's he spent more time in and around the wrestling business than just about anyone in the world. If you think about it, yeah. He grew up in the business as a promoter. Did every so job in the industry before he ended up um, running WWE. Now I, I feel like the the big cheese, so to speak, of Lucha Underground: Mark Burnett, Robert Rodriguez, Eric Van Wagenen, uh, Tony Denson, Josie yeah. Lambert, Christy Joseph, Chris Roach, Matt Stallman. Those people, I feel like, are much more collaborative. But me personally, I'm also at a different level in my career. My wrestling psychology now is far more solid than it was 10 years ago when I was Johnny Nitro and I was just starting in the business. Yeah. The ideas that I have right now aren't like, I got an idea. Yeah. How about you make me champion? Yeah. You know, the uh, the ideas that I have now are more character based and storyline driven, and for the betterment of the show with the idea that we want to hook viewers. Mm. Um, I don't think there's, I don't know, I, I, I feel like I've been pretty lucky with regard to uh, to bosses. Um, mm. I haven't really had to uh, put up with anyone that seems completely unreasonable. There's, there's usually some method to the madness and yeah. uh, as far as how uh, Bosses get to become bosses. They don't just get that opportunity based on nothing. Mm, definitely. Well, thanks for the time, John. And um, you've been watching the Bade Zone podcast show with your host, Baden Redshaw. You can go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Baden Redshaw1. Uh, we've got uh, John Morrison here. He's also got a Twitter account. Go ahead and follow him at uh, The hey, Real yeah, Morrison. Yeah. Let, me, let me plug some stuff too. Yeah, we're, plug we're some stuff. Go ahead. Doing, doing the wrap up. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at the real Morrison. You can follow me on Instagram at John Hennigan, which is my shoot name. <laughs> you can check out new episodes of Lucha Underground on the L Ray Network Wednesdays at eight PM if you're in the United States. You lucky believe, Americans. America. <laughs> I believe you can get them on uh, iTunes at the iTunes store. I'm gonna you get onto that. Check out my movie, Boone the Bounty Hunter on IMDB, uh, just check it out, tweet me, let me know what you think, and if you want to get beefy like a roast with less body fat than a ghost, check out outofyourmindfitness.com, um, www.ooymfitness.com to get a complete functional training regimen designed by Jeff Carrier and me. Awesome. Alright, well go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel, Bades One, because we're going to have a ton more of these podcasts coming your way with uh, more special guests. Uh, hopefully I can get a hold of some more for you all. Um, and yeah, thanks for watching. And please do hit that subscribe button. we got more coming. Alright, sweet. Out!